Hello, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for coming out today and joining us this Sunday afternoon. My name is Tom Snarsky, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Inside, 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 um, a reading and conversation with my friend, the poet Joe Yanni. I'd like to begin uh, this afternoon by thanking Jack Hawk, who's on the call with us, and without whose Zoom access, this event would not be possible. Uh, thank you so much, Jack, for agreeing to be our Zoom host and for being so welcoming, um, and we're just really, really glad uh, to have this opportunity to do this and to not be like, you know, stopping Joe at the 40-minute mark and, you know, come what may after that. Um, also, I'd like to thank everybody taking the time who is here, um, whether it's Sunday afternoon and you're in the Zoom call with us live, or maybe you're listening to this recording on YouTube. Thank you so much for participating in this poetry conversation with us. Uh, as with everything Joe and I do in Poetry Land, this is an experiment uh, it, in participatory poetics, and it would be less than nothing if you weren't along with us for the ride. Um, less than nothing, Joe told me he's been listening to some Zizek to get ready for today. So, you know, hopefully you'll get some delightful repartee when the discussion part of the program gets going. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing this afternoon. Um, during the event, Joe is going to read us his Apartment 9 Press chapbook, Inside, 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 from cover to cover. Uh, as the poems do what they do to you, feel free to start thinking of questions you might like to ask Joe, things you might bring want to bring into conversation, um, because after the reading, Joe and I are going to talk for a little bit about his poems, his process, some other things that um, have come to mind while I've been engaging with his work for a while. Um, and then we very much hope to open the floor to anyone who would like to join in and talk with us a little bit about poetry. So I'm really, really excited to get this started. Um, without any further ado, I'm basically feeling pretty ready to introduce Joe and turn it over for reading of Inside, Inside, Inside. But I want to take my copy and read um, the very official bio at the back because that feels like the right way to introduce Joe. Joe Iani is an artist who works with poetry. Joe, take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, thanks so much, Jack, uh, for making this possible. And everyone here, um, as Tom said, uh, so much of not only what I do, but we, what we do as poets, um, what we hope to do as poets uh, involves our, our lineages, uh, past, present, and whatever the virtual future means. Um, so I guess with, the, with that kind of question in mind, you know, it's, it's important for me to say um, that all of this, which is like a wonderful celebration of being together, you know, all of this happens in contestation. Um, and I always, you know, I have to think about that before we, before we do most of what we do. Um, and I was talking to a friend just yesterday, maybe on, on some very different topics, but, you know, I think it's important, or I, I guess it's important to say that I worry uh, when acknowledgement doesn't transform us. Um, and there'll be, I think, a more conversation about what acknowledgement means in regards to like a poetic lineage when when we get to kind of the, the question period. Um, with that said, um, I, I want to kind of start at the end of the chat. Uh, by saying endless gratitude to poets, um, however they come, and for those myriad and miraculous forms of sustenance that include water and friendship. Now I'm just going to share. Um, I'm going to share the poems with you as we as we kind of move along, just so that you can see everything. Great. Hopefully you can all see that now. And we'll start here. Dwell, welds, seams, many crushed sometimes clang of repairs that wobbly cry between tiles inside, 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 flick a string of nows in situ, thin air, this glorious mess dwindle. Troubled thoughts, proof of finish, living between ears and cheeks, the sunflower's head, a red ant ripples, fiddling around the orbit room. Do well, dwell. The moon is a common symbol. Why would the moon do this? Bless the work which keeps insanity sane. Wish it over and over and over and over till it ends. 
private little song which sends the story along. Her eyes were so green, but I wanted to be home with you. The sun welds me to this here place, a shattered pair of glasses in the gutter, walking into sunrise everywhere, everywhere big cabbage leaves grow, make their shapes making their shapes touch, and a bird shits good luck on my shoulder, tries to. Seems show now, I should care, make do, this song come to mind, let them be, find some sense. Small pup wagging its tail, looking at pigeons, friends. Brim of my hat, laughing the whole time, the geese come in pairs, honk so loud. My head might walk off my shoulders, move around, I comb that quiet and smile, worry the many crush sometimes, leave them unanswered. Sitting, sitting in Bellevue Square Park, they're washing their hair in the fountain, power tool sounds like maracas and the birdie noise that forever gives life, disrupted by the clang of repairs. Bell, born, Needle, waves, waves, sustain that wobbly cry, horns held. A brook, the sound between tiles, interlocking rain and wind, wet starling song on the power line, ticks on the window, the brick and plastic surround enter like a sadness felt or joy or inside 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 flick absence reappears in a special little lick cut from all that noise turned around click watching a clock the ticks and life is broken, divides. This word long enough, jittering a string of nows. An odd experience talks of set tiny segments, moment, tick. Feel as if I can't keep saying tomorrow. In situ, exquisite acts, fang, jittering. Segments meet. Weaving impossible out of this thin air, a glorious mass, full, open of digressions and missing pieces. Could cloud the loud sea, said days pass, fish, hush. Wolves bewildered by leaves, reeds believe, do idols, dwindle, led by wind, winds the dell to heed, delete. The wildflowers, if only they'd come. Clouds can be imagined, petals, troubled thoughts, filled with white hairs of offers. Head full, stingy, belly ache, laid another day, called in, thumb, sleeve, inhale, glow, bent, night, sleep, eludes, throat, closed, eyes, pretend, twitchy, Proof of elsewhere. The gift of flesh to hide and find the keys rattle. Overheard promise from the spider in my hair. An itch, a stare, 
then upstairs crushed into bed, dismissing myself of any more bad ideas. Finished, finished, polished. Thump thump goes the voice inside my head. All this ugly me talking, twist, glassless night, accident of curve and split, falling asleep, under spell, under spider bedfellows, living between old slats of factory that once was is, all this between through which I love you. Ears and cheeks, it's all my head, heat, read, breath, heard, not you, not me, not not, presence, not my back. In a rush rush, from what or do I mean why? A yellow stung and later angry for then staring at back of the sunflower's head, sorry. Rhythm of fabric moving, some song in relief. Colorful and crude, the drawings chalk. I don't know of what, some childish assumption, the presence of stretched out form a cave and it's inside me and I'm inside it. Today, bit by a red ant and it spread a red sun in the crook of my elbow. It stung and stuck until it shrank shrank as the day did, went by, shrunk now into a small rosy dot. An hour into sleepy already, I hear downstairs good night saying the cat shuffling dishes, the HVAC whirring away, click, light, and underneath gone out. You come up the stairs groaning into bed, set the alarm, but it's already tomorrow, August 30th. Wrist, click, stone, flat, round, perfect, pitch, skips, over, own, ripples made, ripple, reach, back, for sure, wrist, click, stone, flat, round, perfect, pitch, skips, over, over, own, ripples made, ripple, reach, back for sure, wrist, flick, stone, flat, round, perfect, pitch, skips, over, over, own, ripples made, ripple, reach, back for sure. Soften sky in gaps, variable. Once light, night returns, fiddling around. I crush a snail near the maple growing back. I play with my keys, that's how I keep sure. There, still here, and not lost. Ill, death, dim, lish. The Orbit Room, April 21st. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. That in its entirety was Inside, Inside, Inside from Apartment 9 Press in 2022. Um, so I'm really excited to have those poems sitting in all of our ears um, for the moment. And to start our next leg of the program for today, um, I have a few questions that I've prepared for Joe because we've been talking about this chapbook for a long time and the poems that went into it. Um, some of these are things that I got the privilege to write about um, for the review that I did of Inside, Inside, Inside for Ecotheo that came out. Um, but there's only a few questions that Joe and I are going to talk about together. And then we'd love to invite you all, uh, if you'd be willing to participate and ask Joe some of the things that are on your mind with these poems um, going on in your heads and in your ears. Um, and Joe, I just wanted to start with a question that comes from a poem or a pair of poems actually right in the middle of the book 
um, the poem that begins weaving. So I, I like the repetition um, and I would love to read those two poems again. So in the middle, you have weaving impossible out of this thin air, a glorious mess, full open of digressions and missing pieces. And I can see when I uh, open the book to that page, like the string right in the middle, holding the book together, literally. Um, and it feels kind of apt because I, I feel like those two poems sit in a kind of tension or complementarity. Um, you've got weaving this, this impulse sort of of order and of bringing together and uh, a gloriousness, which is like that great feeling of disorder of letting the, the disordered pieces in. Um, I'm guessing if those if these two impulses are real impulses, how do you navigate them when you're writing those sort of push, push towards putting things in order and keeping them purposely maybe out of order? And then what maybe would you say to someone on this score who might like hear your poems for the first time and think just knee jerk reaction? This doesn't make sense. What would you say to that person? Well, I'll start. I'll start with how. I don't know, I was once in a workshop and one of the poets in the workshop shared that uh, when people give insights into their poems, sometimes they give an insight that's, I don't know, unsatisfactory to the reader. Um, something like, oh, that was just my grocery list. Or, you know, oh, I, you know, like everyone wants it to be deeper than it is. Um, Sometimes the influences for the poems are nothing more than, you know, my my partner knits. I'm wearing a sweater that my partner knit and weaving is like so much a part of our daily life. Um, and yeah, that has like a kind of metaphoric resonance, certainly like trying to weave together the disparate, you know, the disparate things in your life and make them work. And sometimes, you know, that's hard to do and you have to leave space, which is so much of what I think about. Um, but also you have to kind of see glory in that, that there's, that there, that there's still room. Like one of the things I wrote in my notebook recently is like, often, I think what often brings people to writing isn't necessarily that language does everything, but that empty space that language fills, right? That we believe in that space. <laughs> I'm not sure if that fully answers the question, but I, I think that maybe that's, what I'm trying to offer other people with like how much room there is, is that like you kind of, you need room to weave in, like there are things to weave, but you need room to weave and it might seem impossible and it might seem messy. But I think if you believe in that space, then there's, there's room to work in. And I hope that we can like make that, make that the case even more is that people believe that there's space to work in. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. And I, I realized I forgot to mention um, for folks in the chat, if you want to jump in uh, with other follow up questions about Joe's answers, feel free to let us know by like raising your hand or using the chat feature, because I, I think it's really interesting what you mentioned about the space, creating that like empty space uh, in which to do this work, because that's one of my ways of trying to understand that a glorious mess or that like that disorder um, piece. So like creating something that isn't filled in maybe the way you might expect, or that is maybe uh, empty when you might be expecting something full. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe say a little bit before we shift gears into a slightly different topic about um, how you kind of keep that sort of, I don't want to say void exactly, but that feeling of like the poem not necessarily being like the word finish shows up at a few places and inside, 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 and like what that what that means um for you as opposed to like finish as a as a sort of polish or a total end or cut off of a poem yeah I often there's like a philosopher that's worth bringing up and and it's more the title of the book that's kind of inspiring than than I haven't read the book the title is interesting it's called uh I think it's called it was, was it it's, it's Bifo Berardi and it's and the phenomenology of the end, or is it the other way around? Is it and the phenomenology of and? No, it's the first one. It's the first one. So it's that's an interesting way to think about endings, is that endings are endings. Um, so that's one kind of thing, thing that comes to mind. But also, yeah, like what you were saying is that the word finish denotes in many cases an ending, right? It denotes the case that like something is done. But I like to think or bring into contact with that understanding, finish as in polishing, 
as like adding a patina to something, as adding a, a, a texture to something. You know, how do we finish? How do we finish something in that way rather than ending it um, in this kind of complete cut off way? Like, how do we add a texture to something or a polish to something? Um, and hopefully that brings in a sense of of ending that is that is tactile that like we engage in um, rather than an ending that feels like a brick wall. Um, and I don't know, like maybe I'm just like weird. Like even the brick wall almost asks me to touch it and to feel to feel that. But I might be a weird kid that way, you know. Like I want to touch the flame, and then even when I get burned, I want to touch the flame again. Um, but I kind of hope that that's the case. That the the poems can be a little bit. They're open, but they're they're also bristly too, right? They're not. Um, they've got loose ends. And those loose ends, I'm kind of hoping, are in some ways tied up or or complete completed in a in a more open ended way, uh, by by an, by an interaction with a reading audience that like I hope that I almost presuppose as being there. You know, one of the things I think is really important to me as a reader is to like always I am always the first reader of my text, even though I'm I'm creating it, I'm I'm the first reader. So there's always a reader there. Uh, even when I'm there writing, creating, making the text. Yeah, I'm going slightly off script here, but I, I'm really curious about one of the things that I that I heard you talk about, because one of the bits in Inside, Inside, Inside that stuck out to me a lot the first time I read it um, is the moment about, it, there's a moment towards uh, the end where you have colorful and crude, the drawings, chalk, I don't know of what, some childish assumption, the presence of stretched out form a cave and it's inside me and I'm inside it. And like when I first read that bit, the part of the childish assumption and the sort of drawings, the colorful and crude drawings, I really loved the way that those like stood in for me a little bit as like figures of what, you know, what kinds of weird assemblages poems are, right? That they're these, they're colorful, they're crude. I don't know of what they really are, right? In your sense of like the unsatisfying sort of poet's answer to what, you know, what, what's going on here, as it were. Um, and I, I wonder if maybe you could say a little bit about that, like the the quote unquote childish assumption that that happens in that little moment in the poem that like, what does it mean to kind of come to the poetry or come to the the writing um, without necessarily, like from that perspective of, let's say childishness, or let's say like, or maybe we could call it incompletion, like still growingness or something like that. You can probably say better than me. No, yeah. And again, so part of uh, when constructing uh, these pieces with my notebook and like making notes, um, like this is really like I came across a chalk drawing on on a, a sidewalk and I couldn't make sense of what it was, but it was kind of like fun in that way and abstract in the way that that childish thinking is already kind of abstract. So for me, I wondered if my assumption that it was made by a child, right, whether the childish assumption is mine that it was made by a child, um, or, you know, this, this childish kind of drawing assumes a, a space of, of already wonder and knowing. Um, that I end up getting cap, uh, I, I end up getting captured by in a certain way, or 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 drawn into as if it were a cave, right? So alighting, I think to some degree, my philosophical mind of like being in the cave. But where is the cave inside me? Uh, is it out there? And that's where I was like, uh, maybe this childish drawing, this childish chalk drawing I came along allowed me to reconstruct for myself, you know, where that cave is happening you know, what what I'm caving into. And I do, I think a lot about the the idea of the child. And we, you know, poets have said it before, other writers have said it before, you know, it's art is about keeping the child alive. But I, I kind of hope for that notion of a child for us to be simultaneously, like I want, I want too much. I want uh, the child to remain this like very practical idea of the child is like, yeah, it's a little kid. But I also want the child to be something that's not a little kid. That's a, a, a way of being. Um, and I guess like the childish assumption is a way of, is a way of snaking both things, right? Is that I get the child, the, the little kid, but I also 
there's the assumption that it's that it's an actual being rather than a way of being and I, you know it's when you're able to kind of snake those two things you can get your mind your body to feel very differently about the things you encounter I really love that. And I'm, I'm glad you spent a moment in that image uh, of the cave, because one of the things that it's a nice segue into the next question I was hoping to ask you, because uh, in the review I wrote of Inside, 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 one of the things that um, I tried to hope I tried to take a speculative guess at was that if you think about the sort of Plato's cave thing, it might be less that the speaker of your poems is like, somebody in the cave or somebody holding up the, you know, the shadows or whatever, it might be more of like a, a worm kind of burying itself and digging through like the walls of the cave and creating this like aeration that is not quite in the like problematic as we normally think of it in the cave, but it's still doing something and it's still part of the, the terrain and of the scenery. Um, because I think that that's like one of the things that, that um, challenges me most in a good way when I read your poems is the way that they kind of take on this perspective, like you said, that's both like, sometimes human and not. Sometimes it's about these like very human sized perceptions that we have. And sometimes it's about perceptions that are at a little bit of a different level of, of granularity. Um, and one of the ways I, I wanted to kind of get into this with you is to talk about the bestiary, if you will, of inside, 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 because it's a really, um, it's a little, it's a very crawly and wriggly little book in a way that I really love. It's got um, it's got so many animals. It's got uh, the snail, the red ant, the small pup, and then uh, animals in groups like wolves, fish, and birds. Um, also some non-animal life like wildflowers, leaves, and I would even argue that like the clouds and inside, inside, inside take on this like panpsychic dimension too. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the sort of bio and eco diversity that is inside III um, and, and how the work of kind of making these poems plays into just, you know, ecological life and, and being in this, these big systems. Yeah. So it's like, it's almost Tom and you've heard, and you've, you've had these discussions with me before. It's like almost a horribly simple, like horribly simple answer, right? It's like, we are already embedded. Um, when you live in a city like I do, sometimes the, the animal life, like the squirrels, the birds, um, any little bit of, of greenery is really prominent, in fact, because they stick out, they stand out. And on my walks, um, on my walks, I'm always encountering them. I spend a lot of time walking, partly, you know, because uh, of trying to, like, you know, save money on transit, but also to, like, be in the world. Um, so, yeah, there's this, there's this way in which, like, the they show up in my notes because I end up walking every day. They they kind of are with me in the world in 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 some very simple uh, I don't know factical way. The birds are the birds are there. The clouds are there. They're moving and they're alive and they're they're alongside me and they're with me. So if I were to leave them completely out of the poem, I think they'd find their way in. It's it's so strange what ends up in the in the book like in in, pre, in preparing for this for instance you know I found out how how quickly I could read the book like and and I was saying with you like wow I I, I literally made a book that fits in a 15 minute break at work like you could rate you could read this thing in your 15 minute break and that's really that's really where you know I'd be making notes on my 15 minute break if not before uh coming to work uh walking home after work on my weekends so like there's this direct relation to these to these things we're living up against right um and language is one of one of those things we're living with and up against right so i think uh you know when when there's ones where the wolves come in and the fish come in those are less common in like the toronto landscape to come across a wolf or a fish but you know if you look at that poem one of the things that i was doing and, and and what was happening for me in the poem was I was letting each line kind of descend from the last, right? Um, you know, could cloud is like a transformation of the words into what could be around them or what's already hiding in them. You know, do dwindled, wind is already in dwindled. So letting the language actually by being alongside it help me get get along the way, right? Uh, and move along. So in the same way that I'm I'm finding myself 
beside uh, the grackles and starlings that I that live near my building, or the the you know the the dogs that people keep as their pets here. I'm I'm alongside and beside language too, and it's evolving, right? So it's all very organic, and it's these organic forms interacting with each other. And whether you decide to whether you decide to specifically state that they end up in somehow. Like I think you once, Tom said, you know, you can always hear the bird. You said to me, you could always hear the birds in the background of your poems, even when they're not there. And I'm not surprised by that comment, like even if I agree with it or not. Um, but yeah, I think that it's interesting what ends up in in our forms. Again, that against our permission, we don't have that kind of control. And I think part of me is like, I, I say, you know, like, okay, I'm okay with like not having that control. Let's see what happens. Speaking of not having total control of the conversation, I think it would be really cool because uh, I, I noticed we have at least one question from John in the chat. And so I was hoping maybe if people have other things that they would like to ask Joe about or talk about just as a, as a group together. Um, I was hoping, John, maybe if you'd be willing to unmute and say a little bit about your question in the chat. Um, for people who are maybe on the recording and then we can kind of keep the conversation going as it arises if you want to ask questions in the chat or raise your hand and unmute um whatever go ahead and we're, we're excited to talk with you um but john do you want to say a little bit about your question sure i just as you uh my heart rate just increased um that was really kind of a fun exciting thing to feel happening i still it's still happening in my in my chest right now um, cause I was, I was, I found that I was very happy to sit there and listen and, and take notes and type a thought or two, but yes, I'd be happy to, um, to, to say hello to everyone. Um, and yeah, sort of say a little bit more about what I just typed in. Um, <clears throat> cause I had not had the chance to read through the whole chapbook. Um, although I've been, I've been reading Joe's poems, uh, just online or, or on social media, um, partly through, and this is big shout out to Tom for pointing well, kind of pointing me to Joe and Joe to me. Um, uh, but yeah, in, in, in listening to the poems and reading and reading through them on the page simultaneously, um, one of the things that I was taking notes about, I was really excited to, to notice is just uh, this kind of motif of prepositions. And I mean, the title of the book, Inside, 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 but then as, as the preceding discussion um, demonstrates, there's so, and, and as Joe was talking about his walks, all of that is happening outside. Uh, in one sense, um, although, of course, all of this mixing and uh, entangling of an inside and outside is precisely what what I think is going on. But I was just curious to to maybe hear, um, you know, anything else, Joe, that you uh, might have thought about while writing the poems or in retrospect about um, that that sort of tangling, entangling of inside and outside, both uh, literally and, and also maybe more phenomenologically, but uh, uh, and, and part of what the other thing too, off to the side of all this is is Larry Eigner's poems, um, and Eigner, of course, was in so many ways kind of confined to uh, to being more inside and kind of looking out and you know dreaming and reaching out or bringing outside in in a different way. So just any anything that comes to mind uh, with that little uh, fragmentary comment slash question. <laughs> Thanks, John. It, it's so nice to hear your voice. I know we've spoken online a little bit, and and uh, John's a, John's a great poet too. I really like John's work. It's it's something that's quite inspiring. Um, I'm glad you bring up Eigner. Um, I think we don't we we really don't talk enough about uh, Larry. He was you know he is a wonderful poet. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, I have so many feelings about Larry. Um, love Larry. But yeah, to speak, I, I think I, through this book, and continue to struggle with what is inside and what is outside. Um, I'm more and more trying to take on what it means to go through these things and what happens when we go through these things, like what transformations are we already embedded in? Um, I'm often thinking about the impasses of like, philosophers who I find very interesting who are asking these questions what does it mean to be one thing or another um you know Moton is the first person who comes to mind Fred Moton 
you know, what is it to go through these things, to come out from under these things, um, to be, uh, yeah, to come through. I'm also thinking about a philosopher me and Tom have talked about named Emmanuel Severino, um, who, whose kind of core belief is that being is eternal, um, that there is no outside and inside, which again, like, it's a question I'm still asking myself because sometimes I say, and it's a question of the title. That's why it was so funny when Cameron, uh, my friend and publisher, was like, I think inside, inside, inside is one is one interesting title because I think the repetition of that is very childish in a way that I'm interested in to repeat the word, but also in repeating the word, it destabilizes the word, right? Um, I remember a conversation with uh, Kave Akbar and uh, Josh Charles, where uh, Josh Josh was saying, you know, when someone says red, when a kid says red red, all of a sudden we think we we think of a redder red, right? It's not just um, it's not just one one word and then the one word again. It's those two words beside each other start to already they're already in a relation. And in in regards to like the text, when I started making the text, I really didn't know where it was, what it was going to look like, and what was going to happen. I think my conversations with my friends, with Tom, and working with Cameron, my the publisher, the book is as much theirs in some way. So in 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 regards to that, like the book doesn't even necessarily seem to come from inside me, um, but is kind of these relationships that I'm moving through. So that's where like. I found myself during and after, like during and after the text and where I kind of see myself settled now is like, what do I do in this, this passageway, this threshold that the text and, and me are already embedded in. It's very confusing even for me to talk about it um, because the, you know, from a phenomenological perspective, you know, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not sure how it feels. I'm still kind of making, trying to make sense of how it feels and what it will mean for texts in the text I, I I try to create or try to move towards in the future. Um, and you know, you made me think of because you made me think of Eigner. There's this one poem by Eigner that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna remember it off offhand, but where Eigner is kind of talking about how I think it's heat and heat is kind of moving through the walls. Um, it it starts outside. But it passes through the walls, and it, 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 and it, and it, you feel it inside your home, and then already it's inside you, and it's causing sweat, and it's coming out. So it's hard to speak about, but that's where I'm finding myself now. Is like, how do I enter those relations, feel those relations, stay with those relations, and see what uh, what occurs while in them. Awesome. And I saw while Joe was answering uh, Cameron and Trisha, I saw a hand. Do you want to say a little bit about your question? Hey, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, Joe, I'm, I'm always just amazed at um, how minimum, minimally profound and profoundly minimal your work is and the generosity you give to space, uh, not just uh, spatially generous, but uh, thinking temporally uh, generous as well. Um, but there's these two lines, and I'm sorry if I misquote, that are, are still sort of ringing in my ears. Um, thinking of the clang of repair, and I'm thinking of the, the space that occurs when in the line of uh, the in-between in which I love you, or something along those lines. And I'm wondering, Joe, if you could speak a little bit um, about the sort of spatial scale, the sort of scaling that you're working with, not just spatially, but temporally, and how it might, um, what sort of repair that, that offers to you. And I'm also struck by the word clang in the midst of, um, it's this very metallic word in the midst of this very, as we were discussing with you, this uh, bio, Okay, so Cameron, I think I think I missed a little bit of the ending there, but I'm I think I'm, I think I can understand where where you're coming from. Hi, by the way, it's nice to hear your voice. 
Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Oftentimes, when I'm thinking about the poems, they're kind of happening in the here and now. Um, but I make the notes in the here and now. I edit them in the here and now. I make them and toy with them in the here and now, you know, and they they make these kind of echoes. And, and there is kind of the, the, the temporality in which they exist is to say very simply is the present. But the present, the present in not this presentist way where like only where the present is uh, so is momentary and fleeting. I think that the present is actually, you know, grander or 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 more pregnant than than we want to believe. It's not a fleeting moment. Um, so when those things start to stack, maybe or or interact, when when my editing forms a relationship with um, the note taking, the note taking forms a relationship with the the putting into it, putting into a series of texts that interact with other notes. It seems that all of that is happening in a very, you know, in a wider, yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, an extended present, an enduring present. I'm sure I've said that to you before. Um, and someone in the chat is reminding me of my own language. Um, yeah, there's this extended present or this uh, this enduring present um, that, that I think I'm operating in, and, and I can't just like the inside and in, in, you know these dichotomies of inside and outside. I can't say that it's I can't say from where I'm standing, from where I am, whether that present is huge, or whether it's infinitesimally small. Um, sometimes it is. It feels very small, and it can be uh, frustrating and a struggle uh, because as a writer, you feel like, why would anyone care about this? Um, but then it seems like it's here for me in some enduring way. Um, you know, what can I make of this? Um, and I think it's just about how we attend, but I'm not sure. I would say like my, my simple answer is that I work, I work in the here and now. Um, but they probably don't have the same connotations as, as many presentists, I would say, uh, have of the here and now, which is just, I, I think, a way to to askew the future and askew the past. I'm not interested in that. I think that the way we attend to the past and the way we attend to what might be the future happens from the here and now, and that they extend from the here and now in, in a way that is urgent and incomplete. Uh, and Kenny mentioned in the chat uh, the enduring present, sort of reminding uh, or like evoking a little of Merwin. And we've we've heard a little bit about like Eigner and about uh, Moten and a few other people uh, whose whose prose, whose poetry, whose words, whose sounds are sort of in your ear formatively in this particular way. Um, and I, I'm like somebody who who when I read or write, like it's a very lateral process. It's very much like entering into conversation with the living or the dead or, or what have you. Um, and, and I was just kind of wondering if you could say a little bit, whether it's about like inside, inside, inside in particular, or other texts that you've been working on making, like just who the, who the people in person, like personae are who are in your ear in this process and who especially, um, and you know, this is very broad, right? I think it could be, could be a real person, could be, could be a bird, could be whatever, right? But like, who are the people who you go to for that? Um, or who kind of like, you know, bang, bang around in your head a little as you're, as you're doing this poem making thing? So, yeah, there's, there's a part of me that could just start like, enumerating a list that would never end. Um, there's part of me. And then I also think of one of my friends, my very good friend, someone who I, I admire greatly is in the chat, uh, Shaista Latif, who says to me, you know, every once in a while, you should try to thank, you should try to thank and enumerate those people, Joe, um, just for your own recollection. And like, Shaista is one of those people who I'm thinking about constantly, uh, the work, um, the work that you do is amazing, and the ways that you've helped me think. Um, continue continue to help me not not only through making this text but but i'm sure 
will help me in the as these as more unfolds as more unfolds um and there's so yeah there's so many other people in this chat there's friends there's coworkers um of mine who who fall adjacent uh to you know a poetry scene or poetry as a as an art and a craft who give me a lot of interesting feedback um in regards to these but yeah like there's also the non-human forms that teach me you know uh birds clouds just watching them and seeing how they live and how they um how sometimes you can take on aspects of them just by attending to them um and that helps me talk about like somebody who made made me realize that very deeply was Joshua Beckman talking about watching um birds in one of his lectures talking about watching birds and then finding that you start acting like one while trying to watch them you start to like stutter and move your head in strange ways um and that kind of happens post factually we post rationalize that that uh that alighting but yeah Joshua is someone I think of often uh his, his language is is very much a part of me um Hua Huan, who's a, a, a great teacher of mine, whose work is incredible, um, helps me learn what to do with gaps, how to how to deal with silences and what is missing, um, and and makes me think about the the word sing inside of the word missing, right? Then there's you know there's there's Noel Cocot, there's there's obviously I've mentioned I've mentioned Moton not only as a as a thinker but as a, as a poet there's yeah there's just so there's so many people it's hard to keep track of them uh who else would I who else would I mention you know Joss Charles Joss is uh, reminds me all the time to remember that there's a world that lives inside the world and it's important to remain in relation to that world as much as you're trying to navigate this one that we have to kind of operate in and is sometimes beyond confusing especially in our day and age who else who else would I mention just all all my friends my partner um who lives with me and my scary mind at sometimes I I don't know how they do it um it it's it's hard to enumerate the how many people are, are really involved in like my individual practice like I was just saying to a friend the other day you know the individual is really nothing but a profusion of the collective um so you know, as I continue to like, I don't know, make my peninsula or like outgrow from the land, like the whole land needs to be thanked, right? And then there's all the things that are that are that are fueling this that are not uh, that are very difficult to thank, you know, that you have that you have a job that can help you uh, sustain yourself while you do this. Like there's many a poet who are, are who, like their job is in doing doing poetry, teaching, reading. Um, I don't that's not my relationship so you know like I was saying before it's funny that I made a book that fits in a 15 minute break it's that's really fascinating to me and I have to ask myself what that means going forward so I don't know do I have to thank the uh the work week I, I don't know maybe I have to thank that too thank you to the work week <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to mention at this point that I, I do have other things that I would love to talk to Joe about, but Joe and I talk all the time, so I, I do also want to invite, um, if you do have any sort of burning questions, thoughts that you'd like to share, um, comments, any anything that's come to your mind from Joe's, Joe's poems, Joe's talk and, and answers so far, um, please feel free to use the little raise hand button in Zoom or feel free to use the chat if you're more comfortable. Uh, that way, we'd be happy to sort of read the question and, and share it that way as well. Um, but yeah, please, please feel free to jump in anytime. Um, because again, I don't want to, I don't want to hog Joe. I have Instagram DMs for that as well, so I can send him voice notes later of all the things I'm curious about. Um, but feel free if you if you do have questions or you would like to jump in, we would love to hear from well, you. I yeah. think I have to like really explain myself when I say thank the work week, like. What I what I mean by that is there are people who work very very hard to make it the case that we have breaks, uh, and that and and that there's a lot of contestation 
about what it means for us to be able to have the space that we have. Um, so when I say I thank the work week, I thank those I thank those who continually and who have worked for us to even be able to like do things like this, um, which is difficult, which is the work the work necessary to get us the time to be creative, to be able to meet with each other, to be able to wonder, to give us the space to wonder in. There needs to be, there always needs to be space to thank them. And it's very difficult because it's not always easy to point out who those people are. Um, or there's lots of things in the way, occluding, occluding and, and mystifying the, the, the work that those people do. So I guess like that's a way to, I'm taking myself to task before I end up thanking people who I really, really shouldn't be thanking. Yeah, Joe, you and I have talked a lot about poetry happening on stolen time um, and thinking about what that feels like. And I think I would love to hear a little bit because you, you've mentioned uh, briefly, I think, the notes that you make um, and the note making process uh, and what that kind of looks like for you, whether it's just like carrying a notebook around and and sometimes it's stuff that it happens while, for example, you might be listening to like a talk or, or something that is verbal, or maybe you're just walking through the city and you're hearing snippets of conversation or sounds, et cetera. Because like one of the things that has been true in my experience, at least, is that like, you know, to, to have these small accretions of writing as opposed to thinking, oh, I need to make a poem today. Like I need to make this finished thing. Um, can sometimes be easier to slip into those like cracks of the day, right? Those like between moments of of work or of life or of of what have you. And I'm sort of curious about that. Like if you could say a little about what it's like to kind of turn to to take those notes or make those notes at all. And then what happens to them after you've made them? How do you kind of recur with them, iterate with them? And what happens when they turn into poems? What happens when they don't? Um, I'd be really curious to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so in in one way, Tom, like that's that's the space I have to operate in. Um, the form of note taking comes out of the fact that much of my time is spent, much of my time is spent trying to to live and survive within the conditions that we're operating in, right? Um, under like under imperialism, under capitalism, um, there's only for particular kinds of workers, for people in the working class, we only have so much time, like. Uh, you know, behind this this curtain behind me, there's a wall of like sticky notes of like notes and doodles and and drawings that I'll make on, you know, I'll make sometimes between things at work. Um, that's the form that I have offered to me. And I think I think it's Borges who says, you know, something to the effect of whatever poem you manage to write, like that's a blessing to some degree. He says something more specific than that, I, I think, but what I've taken from that, that, from what he said was, you know, you should, you should try to take some generosity in what you, what you are offered. And that doesn't mean we should like not press for more space or try to figure out how we could, I always tell people like, there's no making time, but there is taking time, right? Um, you know, we're, your manager and your boss will always talk about um, time theft, but that only that only works one directionally. Eh? Like they only talk about it in terms of you, you know, punching in early, uh, punching punching out late, whatever. It's like, but if you have to stay five ten minutes extra to help a client or do some job, um, you know, nobody nobody's talking about theft in that direction. So I think it's important for us to take time, um, and and in take and in doing so, taking up taking up space so like I think though I work in notes because that's what I can I can do um and I think there's there's more in me now to push back against that to try to you know as as Tom knows I've been working very hard to extend my line to think about writing prose to uh as I'm engaging with like more philosophy again uh you know how to how to write how to write critical theory um moving back into those spaces in 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 ways and seeing what what I can do within the the time that I have um and making sure that I take that time and I think that that's something I offer to other people you know again you can't you may not be able to make time but you can take it uh and you and you should take it when you can 
Nice. I wanted to uh, to share a quote from the chat. Uh, it's Anne Kenny shared a, a Ginsburg quote uh, that says, quote, it is about poetry. It is the one place where people can speak their original human mind. It is the outlet for people to say in public what is known in private. And I, I'd be really curious if you could say a little bit about this quote, because what, what I'm hearing in the quote, too, is the, the sort of we've talked about inside and outside, and maybe we are on our way to talking about public and private. And I'd, I'd be curious how that is striking you now. I'm just going to take a second here to to get this quote to get a, a grasp on it. It's interesting. I I'm not a huge fan of Ginsburg. Um, and I, I can, I find Ginsburg sometimes to be a little too effusive for me. Um, but there's much that I agree with and much that I've learned from like poets of that generation, people like uh, Joanne Kiger or Philip Whalen. Um, and I would say, you know, to, to talk about the private and the public, like, as I said before, the way that the individual is a profusion of the collective, I think that the private in some ways is a dimension of the public, right? That our private, our privacy, in, in some ways, the what, what, we, what we retain or what we keep away from people is also a function of the, of the public sphere, right? Um, you know, anytime we write, we're not giving everything um, as much as we may give. Right. Like even if you're a poet who's like given everything, I'm, I'm thinking now of of like Rachel Zucker, who is like, uh, you know, a poetics of like give everything or even of Bernadette Mayer. Right. There's the line, you know, give everybody everything. Um, I still think that whenever we do that or even make that gesture, there's still things we're holding we're holding back. I think that's part of what engaging with form is, is that we're making kind of claims and taking stakes. And that doesn't mean that we can't tarry with those ideas and 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 change that up and how much we give, right? How much we give in those uh, in those situations does say something about how we relate to the public, right? What I keep private, what I only share with my friends is, or what I only share with other poets. That's a function of a different public, right? Like there's the the republic of my friends there's the republic of poets um and yeah so i guess th that would be a way of of and i think of answering or responding to i don't know like i'm not sure what the original human mind is maybe ginsburg knows um but i'm not a hundred i'm not a hundred percent sure um what the original human mind is um I don't I when I think about the originary consciousness behind or or around what we are, I don't know if it would have the adjective human. Um, but I'm not uh, again, I'm not in that I'm not in that position. Maybe Ginsburg was. We will have, yeah, we'll have to get out the Ouija board and see if we can ask, you know, do some Merrilling, Merrilling we roll along. Um, so please, please feel free if you do have other questions you'd like to ask Joe, let us know uh, by feel, feel free to like raise your hand or, or ask in the chat. I do have one, Joe, that I, I'm curious about because it's a little meta vis-a-vis uh, -vis this event. Um, but I know that in addition to this event where we've kind of been having a bit of a conversation, uh, I know that you've done readings where you've read one-on-one -on -one to people, like directly to individual like addressees um, and other sort of more participatory forms of, of sharing poems than like the sort of poet as broadcast sitting at the lectern kind of getting it out unidirectionally um and i'm just so curious about like what what kind of makes that sort of event that that in some ways like i i really appreciated john you sharing something earlier where you were like i had to unmute and my pulse rate goes up because that's like me preparing for anything like this i feel exactly the same way the reading series that joe has read for before is called performance anxiety uh for that reason you know we have all kinds of like weird feelings about it. But I'm curious how kind of putting Joe like the, the reader in this more implicated spot or this more present spot, maybe implicated, I don't know if that's quite the word is that's right. Um, what kind of can it do 
when you have poetry happening in this space that loses that kind of like distance or maybe even protection of like seeing your work on a screen or on a page. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can tell you from my experience, it's different based on different people. Um, when I was doing the one-on-one -on -one readings uh, at the Plum Gallery, um, it was interesting to find that some people were really, really open to what I was doing, which was like, let's work together on what this one-on-one -on -one reading looks like, sounds like, feels like, let's work on that right now um, and see what happens. Um, but that level of openness for some people is too much, right? So I came in ready to offer them something very directed. Um, so it's very interesting the different like how can you be open or ready for the kinds of different people that would come in and and really request or require in some ways very different you know ideas of what it is to be together um and you know I, maybe i'm maybe i'm lucky to to be able to tarry with a lot of that uh difference where other people aren't um just having a capacity capacity for that but yeah, it's it, it's interesting for me. I was I often told uh, people who I've collaborated with in that in that space, it's not very different um, for me when I'm like writing a, whatever a specific poem on a specific page, collaborating certain notes together to make uh, you know the song of the poem. It's not so different for me in my experience of it than working with one person or doing a collaborative poem with a group of people. I'm. It's not, I'm not quite sure what the difference is, um, at least in, in terms of my feeling. There's, there's just different assemblages in which the poem comes to being in. And uh, some of those are like momentary. Some of them have a more, they unfold. Sometimes I don't even realize how the meanings of a poem or their when they congeal, they congeal afterwards or post-factually. I was in a, a workshop where, um, with Ken Babstock and Karen Soley, and one of the things that they shared with me that was that really helped me open a few doors, I think, was, you know, sometimes you can make a poem and meaning happens retroactively. You, you can make, you can kind of make these spaces and the meaning doesn't happen there, it happens a week later. Um, or the meaning that happens there is actually because of something a week prior. But then there's also what opens up in that very space, right? Um, so I don't know, it, it, it's not a, I think for many people, it's not a satisfactory answer. Um, but there, for me, the difference isn't that large when you're working alone in a room or together with a group of people. It, I think it, for me, there's not, there's not that big of a difference. There's just more more chaos to deal with, maybe if there's more personalities, but they're they're both like they're both forms of poesis of making. That's lovely. Yeah. I, I when I heard you were doing the one-on-one -on -one readings, it really made me think about like the way that the sonnet happened and these sort of like chambery feeling places of literally just like reading to a small group of people who you knew and who you could kind of enter this really rich contextual way of writing towards um and, and like the way that that affords something that's really different than even like letting people in uh, in like the poetics of friendship like sometimes feels happens with like new york school poets reading them anyway um, and stuff like that um so yeah we uh, this has been a really really wonderful conversation uh and i i would love to invite if there are any last questions that people would like to ask joe um, thoughts that are on your mind or that you'd like to bring up because I definitely have many many more but uh, I can I can ask whenever uh, and I have one for sure that I would I would like to throw out there um, but if you want to raise your hand on zoom or, or type into the chat um, and let us voice it we'd be really happy to do that um, and and see where where things are in a minute um, and while people might be typing their questions or, or thinking about how to phrase them um, Joe I was also sort of wondering if you could say a little bit um, because this, these are a lot of like really different forms of of engagement with poetry that you've been doing, and um, you know we have inside, inside, inside uh, from Apartment Nine. But I'm also sort of curious what other 
things are in the works for you in this in this kind of abstract way, whether it's things that you're you're hoping will kind of be out in the world to, to have and to hold in the in the not so distant future or things that are just sort of on your mind or uh, in in your sphere at the moment, um, the classic question of what are you working on? Yeah, I, it's, it's, it feels a little bit difficult right now, to be honest. Um, I find myself trying to, to strengthen uh, a belief in, in the longer line in pros. That's where I find myself right now. Um, you know, Tom and me were talking about George Aubin um, not too long ago, and kind of my, uh, my birthday companions, Philip Whalen and uh, Rimbo. Who both, uh, who both and, and often left poetry to, to some degree, right? Waylon becoming a monk, uh, Rambo becoming an arms dealer. Um, often having a, a period there where he left, he left poetry for organizing. And I feel myself, uh, I feel myself drawn in, in those directions to some degree. Um, and I, I'm not sure at this point if they're going to strengthen my practice as an artist or if they will kind of have me go another another way. So I, I think I'll continue making notes. I think, uh, you know, I have, I've had people uh, describe my relationship to poetry as a passion. And my, my, my retort is often, my retort is often, are you passionate about breathing? And, and people are like, Wow, I don't know how to respond to that, but the best answer I got was maybe I should. Um, I was it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting answer. So I don't I don't know. I'll keep uttering away. I'll keep making notes, um, but I do feel that we're living in a time where kind of the arc of, of what we're living through is it's very frightening. Uh, it worries me beyond belief. I worry for my friends. I worry for um, the other people who I live and, and work with. So it's it's difficult to say. I find myself more and more kind of looking to revolutionary poets um, and, and, and philosophers and, and finding myself kind of wanting to know what I can do. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how it will how it'll look for my poetry. I'm sure I'll keep making notes, but these concerns I think will take me in different directions. And I, I'm not sure where that's where that's going to head, but right now, you know, we're just continuing to to write daily. I think of uh, I think of Joanne Kiger who said, you know, the best thing about keeping a notebook or a journal is that when you're done, one throw the book. So, you know, I'll keep I'll keep making books, but maybe they won't reach uh, reach to this level or anything or anything like uh, publication. Who knows? I, I imagine that's not the case, but. I'm thinking a lot about that. Like, where do how do I, how do I continue to act? Nice. We have one question uh, in the chat that will help kind of return us to the the text in question for today of uh, inside, inside, inside. So. Um, Joe, if you could say anything about um, the question says, what compromises, if any, were made to these poems in the process of condensing, question marks of condensing or whatever other action describes what happened to them, uh, them into the form of a chapbook form or layout or maybe weight relative to one another or any other way um, that they relate to one another? Were there ways that the poems shifted in this sense? I, I really appreciate I really appreciate this question. Um, I like I like that I like the word compromise here for its uh, for its word promise. Um, I didn't know what this book was going to look like uh, when I started making it. Uh, to give you a little bit of kind of history, as I, I gave a really long and unwieldy document to my publisher Cameron, and I said, "Please don't be scared." don't have to like it, um, but pick out what you think is interesting uh, and we'll kind of go from there. And after Cameron picked out what was interesting, I ended up creating a new document of things that I was worried he missed. 
um, I was like, okay, well, what about these? Can we weave together your selections with some of these? And then we went back and forth for quite a long time. Um, and that's why I think so much of creating the book is, is a product of a relationship that I built with Cameron, um, as well as conversations I had with other people. I also believe in some way the poems that end up, the poems are incomplete in some way. So, but they are alive in some way to the organic forms that are kind of growing, decreasing, increasing uh, in their own, kind of by their own means. So when I was away at my uh, my partner's parents' place in uh, a small town in Nova Scotia, I played out all the poems uh, for this chat book that we thought were going to be in there. And I, I can't explain it as more than one of the poems. It seemed as if they were shouting at me, I don't want any part of this. I want out. I don't want any part of this. And it was up, I think, to me to listen to that and to you know, and to let that poem go on elsewhere or it will hide itself um, and go back away from the project. And, um, and so that was part of it too. So there's the poems that are kind of speaking their language, speaking to uh, as they relate to all the other you know, texts and notes they're up against and around. And then there's the conversations of, you know, with my partner, with my coworkers, with my friends. All of those are, I don't know, they're not, they're not necessarily compromises, but they are conditions that present themselves that have an effect on the thing that ends up happening. There's also very like concrete things like the book is going to be this long. The pages are going to be this size. Um, you know, there were kind of questions I had for Cameron, like, oh, could we lay it out this way? And Cameron, as a, as a publisher, as a person making a physical book, was like, uh, no, we're not going to do that. That's, it would just create too much, you know, work for this, that, and the other. So I think when we're in a really sustainable, see, you know, when you're in a relation, that seems right, I'm getting sick, but however, now when you're in a relation that seems right, it doesn't seem like compromises are being made. It seems like you're working together to, to help build something, to help support, to help support other relations. I think that's a really beautiful note to sort of draw our conversation to a bit of a close uh, because even being here and asking the questions that you all have asked so beautifully uh, and you know to be willing to engage in this dialogue and poetry I think is part of this very same process um, so you know know that your questions might be somebody's notes now that could be a poem in goodness knows how much time right like and that's that's really one of the most beautiful parts of this whole thing um, so please if, if you do want to interrupt uh, and jump in with the 11th hour question. We would love, love, love to hear it from you. Um, or if you'd like to ask a question when the recording goes off in a few moments, you'd be more than welcome to do that as well. Um, but just one last time uh, as a way of, of tying a, a little bow on this uh, afternoon. Thank you so much to Jack for hosting us on Zoom today. Thank you so much to Joe for reading Inside, 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 and to just answering all these questions with such generosity uh, and patience, especially because my questions are all like five or six lines long in a Google Doc, which is, uh, you know, painful in its way. Um, but and thank you, last but not least, to everybody who was able to join um, this afternoon, whether you're here in, with us in Zoom or listening to a recording. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. We hope that we'll be able to do something like this again. Um, and thank you again for your time. Thank you so much to everyone here. Um, but everyone, thank you for being without these kinds of permission. So I'll tell you about this for this in the future. Uh, people, are, people are welcome in this space too.